Well, thank you very much for that really nice introduction. And it is kind of thrilling for me exactly what Chris said. The, I've done a talk yesterday for not just for sporting directors, but for coaches working at football clubs. And then I was telling them that I was going to come tonight to talk to the Literary and Philosophy Society. And for them, it was just this stark contrast. And for me, it's also like it's a sort of thrilling contrast. And I feel I've kind of reached my peak in, in managing to talk to... Yeah, it's hard to say this without denigrating people in football in some way and, and lifting you guys up, because it's, it's very, they have very different ways of thinking in football. And then, of course, we have the literary, more intellectual way of thinking too. And so we, we spread across those things. So I feel like these two talks really cover some different ways of thinking. And it's ways of thinking that I'm going to talk about tonight. I was given a clicker. Here it is. That's very good. And I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with a statement here. And it's very much related to how I've worked with research. So for me, as an applied mathematician, which I am an applied mathematician, the calculations are secondary. The real question is how can we better understand the world around us? Now, this has been the way that I've been motivated right from the start of doing research. I actually did my PhD here in what was called then UMIST. So I've just heard the story that UMIST went into University of Manchester backwards and forwards. And I was in the last time just before UMIS became part of the University of Manchester. And I worked at the Applied Mathematics Department. And my supervisor there was Dave Broomhead. And he was a remarkable man in that he was, an, he was a mathematician, but he was also a beekeeper. And when he would look at the bees, he would think, well, wait a minute, what, what little algorithms, what little types of mathematics is going on inside those bee heads? And when I talked to him, we got this idea that we'd start working on the mathematics of bees, trying to understand how bees communicate with each other, the algorithms they use to make decisions. And that took me on just the incredible adventure, because then I realized that mathematics isn't, it isn't about sort of solving problems. It's about how you can describe different systems. And as Chris said in the introduction, I went on to work on ants and how they lay pheromone trails and to make decisions about where, where they're going to collect food from. I then worked on locusts, fish schools, pigeons. I'm going to say a little bit about the work I've done on human behavior as well. So anything that was a social animal, I got obsessed with, not because I was so interested in the animals themselves, but because I was interested how I could use mathematics to try and understand them, what would be the, the way of modeling these different types of social behavior. And that's also how I got into football. Now, I'm going to say, first of all, when I wrote this book, I made a conscious decision not to have any football in it. Now, this is given sort of my, if I have a fan base, my fan base is very football-oriented, and that's the thing I get offered to talk about the most. So, but I made a conscious decision to not talk about football in this particular book. But I'm going to sort of break that a little bit and give a few examples of football tonight. But everything, everything in the world, whenever I hear about anything, I think, well, how can I make a mathematical model of that? And what I wanted to do in this book is break it down into four different types of mathematical approaches that we use. And those are, going back to this slide, those are the four hats, statistical, interactive, chaotic, and complex. And, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. And we're going to start by going through each of, these, each of these hats. So we'll start with the statistical hat. Now, in the book, I, I use an historical figure in each case. And I start with this historical figure. This on the right, the right here, is Ronald Fisher. Now, this picture is taken in 1912, when Fisher is a young man. He's a student in Cambridge. And he was studying there in 1912 for the tripos in mathematics in Cambridge, which was then, and is arguably still now, the toughest mathematic education you can do. And he was a very arrogant young man, I can say. He, he didn't just believe that he was the smartest among all of the students that he was, he was studying with. In fact, he got a first in this, uh, in this tripos, and he was declared a wrangler, which was the name they gave to the people who could wrangle mathematics in the way that he could. But he also thought that he was smarter than all of his lecturers. He felt that most of these 
sort of mathematicians, as he dismissed them as, they didn't understand how mathematics underlay the real world. They didn't really grasp, they were like too busy solving equations, they didn't understand the coupling between how mathematics could explain the world. And while he was, instead of studying for his exams, he was sitting there solving problems and writing research articles even then. And as a young man, I think he was about 21, he discovered the method of maximum likelihood, which we use, it underlies a lot of statistics that we use today. He discovered that by himself and wrote down a paper. Now, the problem was that he tried to explain this to the mathematics professors around him, and they had no interest and they had no idea what he was talking about. But he had luck because at Rothamstow, the head of Rothamstow, so Fisher is now on the left here, Rothamstow was an experimental, um, I think it still is today, it was an experimental lab where they do biological experiments, they were interested in growth of crops. And the head of Rothamstead, he wanted someone, he wanted a kind of mathematical person who could look at all their data. So now we're very used to this idea of the data scientist. And I think that he was the first data scientist. They wanted him to look at all the data and analyze and understand it. And one part of this, which I think is a sort of, it's a bit of a charming but maybe a sad story here, but that at this time, it was the first time they actually had women working. It was just after the war, so now we've moved to 1919. And it was the first time they had women working at Rothamsted. And the head of Rothamsted, he thought, well, I'm, when these women arrived, I didn't really know what to do with them. So, but we, but, we, but we, we, what we thought about is that women, they like tea, don't they? So um, what we'll do is we will have tea every, th every afternoon. We will have a nice cup of tea, and then the woman will be happy. And that's what he told Fisher when he arrived. And this became a tradition at Rothamsted, not just for the woman, but for everybody involved. And it was a very appreciated tradition by, by everybody, eventually, that, that they would have tea in the afternoon. And it was on one of these tea parties that um, a, one of the researchers there, Dr. Muriel Bristol, Fisher was about to pour her a cup of tea, and she told, her, she, he, she told him, stop, I don't want to have, I must have my milk first. I can't have the tea before the milk. The milk has to go first. And Fisher was really put out by this. He actually he owned a milk homogenizer at home, which he paid a vast amount of quality money for, and he didn't believe there could be any difference in the order you put your, your tea in. So, he, told her to, so he, he said, there's no way I can accept this. We have to do an experiment. And this was his answer to everything. And he... he well, I'm not going to tell you how the experiment works because you're actually going to, you're going to think about this because what he did is he set up the way that we do these types of experiments. And I'm going to offer you a choice. This is audience participation. participation. So you're going to all have to decide A, B, or C. So this is how Fisher um, tested how, if Muriel Bristol could really tell the difference. So he wanted to know, can she tell the difference if there's milk first or tea first. And he, he asked the um, tea lady to make eight cups of tea, and four of them should be, and so he offered, the, he offered different challenges here. One was to offer a pairwise challenge where you have four pairs of which one is always tea first and the other is always milk first. The second one is to present four of each, milk first and tea first, and then you ask, can ask Muriel Bristol if she can identify which are milk first. And then there's a third alternative here, that there's no difference between these two methods. So I want you to put your hands up if you think that A is the best experimental um, decision. So we've got a few groups over there. Okay, good. Chris is volunteering as well. And who thinks that B is the best experimental thing? Oh, we've got quite a big, big majority for B. And who thinks there's no difference between these two methods? So, yeah. So about, I, I'd, say, I'd say this, that the... Um, you've got it right overall, so there was more people for B, but there was a still a majority, or there was still 50-50 between A and C and B. And I'll explain why that is. Well, it's for the following reason. So let's look at option A first. If we take option A and there's pairs of, of uh, T, then if we look, this is T first and this is milk first, there are, there are two to the power of four 16 ways of setting up this experiment. And that's basically because 
So you can either have all the tea first on the left, or you can have one milk first on the left and tea, and then you, you continue like this. And I can just write out these 16 ways. And the reason, the, the argument here is that there's two to the power of four. So for the first pair, you decide you can have either two. For the second pair, you decide you can have either two. And so the, there's four pairs, so it's two times two times two times two, which is two to the power of four, which is 16. And what this means is the probability that she will get it right is one in 16. If she has no ability to tell the difference, the probability she'll manage to get all four of those correct is only one in 16. And now if we take the other method, option B, where we allow the, uh, we ask her to pick from the tray, we see that there are 70 different ways of doing that. And how do we work out this? Well, first we think about all the ways that we could put down the milk first thing, and there's eight places for the first one. And once we've put that down, there's seven places remaining for the second one, six places for the next one, and five places for the next one. So those are the different ways we can put down the milk first tea. Then we think, well, these milk first teas, it doesn't really matter. There's no difference between them. And so within the ordering of the milk first, we have four times three times two times one. And overall, this lens leads to eight times seven times six times five on the, on the top here, divided by these reorderings that we can do of the individual tea, and we come up with 70. And if you don't fully follow the maths, what you can do, and I, I actually got a little bit bored doing this myself, but I, you can write down all of the alternatives, and you'll find that there's 70 ways of doing it. And what this means is that Muriel Bristol, in this case, would only have a 1 in 70 um, chance of getting it correct. Now, before I, before I go on to this theory, I do want to mention this, because I forgot to say this the last couple of times I've given the talk, is Muriel Bristol nailed this test. So she got it correct, <laughs> even though Fisher set up the, uh, the, the hardest possible test for her. She actually got it correct. And it's funny, because Fisher, I'm going to come back to some of his personality traits, but he could never admit that he was wrong. And so even in the book that he then wrote, where he introduced the T-test as one of his ideas of design of experiments, he kind of sort of smudged over the idea that, she, that she'd actually got it correct. But luckily, in, her daughter's, uh, in his daughter's, autobiog or daughter's biography of him, she revealed the truth that uh, she, Muriel Bristol had managed to tell the difference. 